ask you to stand, if you could, for the reading of God's Word. As we continue here in the Sermon on the Mount, this morning, Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 24. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, once again, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for allowing us to be here, to hear it. We pray that we will learn from it now, and whatever you need to do within us, that you would do, Holy Spirit. We thank you, and of course, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've been studying this Sermon on the Mount together, we've seen, I think quite clearly, that Jesus was not teaching Christians how to live in this sermon, but really he was teaching Jews how to live. He was teaching those under the law how to live. He was teaching really anyone at any time who would want to come to God, those who sincerely want to try and follow God, he was teaching them how to do that. And what he was saying is you need to keep the law. You need to keep the entire law if you want to come to God. And the end result of that, of course, is that men who truly are sincere, because as we know, a lot of people are not sincere. A lot of people just want a little bit of religion mixed into their lives to feel better about themselves. But those that are truly sincere who want to try to get to God, who want to follow God, if they're presented with the law and its demands, they will realize that they cannot keep it. And they will then come to Jesus Christ for mercy and grace and forgiveness. And that is the point of this sermon, as we've been saying throughout, blessed are the sinners who know they are sinners. And then, of course, by the grace of God, repent Jesus has already told us in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And again, as we've already said, the way Jesus did this, and not just in this sermon, throughout his ministry, and we'll see this more as we continue in the life of Christ, and we'll even look at a few things here today, but throughout his ministry, Jesus taught the law. He taught the law so that men would see their need to be forgiven. That's the point of the law, is it not? To show men their sin, that sin might become exceedingly sinful, as Romans 7 says, so that men would then realize their need for God's grace. That's why Jesus said earlier in this sermon, Matthew 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill and we talked about the reason Jesus would even have to say that is because when you look at what we now know as the Beatitudes, verses 3 through 12 there in Matthew 5, basically everything Jesus said there, to them it would sound like he was telling them to sin. 
Because everything he said was against what their religious leaders said. Everything he said was what they said would happen if you were not righteous. And so from their standpoint, it would sound like Jesus is saying that we should just sin. And sin is good. And Jesus says in verse 17, that's not what I'm saying at all. I've actually come to teach you the true law to, just, to show you just how sinful you actually are. He says in verse 20 of chapter 5, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter in to the kingdom of heaven. So you need to be a whole lot more righteous than you're being right now. You need to be a whole lot more righteous than the most righteous people you know, at least the most righteous people you think you know, the most religious people that you know. They're falling short. If you want to merit heaven, you have to be a whole lot better than they are. In fact, you have to be perfect. As he says in Matthew 5, verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And I believe everything in this sermon and everything that comes after that verse certainly is included. Everything in this sermon needs to be seen within this light. This is the main point, the focal point of Jesus' message. You have to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, then you're falling short and you do not deserve heaven. You cannot merit heaven unless you are perfect. Now, there are some great truths in this sermon and even some things that Jesus says today. There are some great reminders, some great principles, some great truths that certainly apply to all men at all times. That includes us today. And I was talking to someone a few weeks ago and I I remember saying that we could go through this Sermon on the Mount the way it, it normally is presented, and we could say a lot of things that are true enough through it. Going through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you could come up with a lot of things that are true enough and that things that we should be doing or not doing and all these different things that Jesus says. But the problem with that, I think, is twofold. Number one... That's not really the point of this sermon. And we want the Bible to obviously be the Bible. And if that's not the point of something, we don't want to treat it as such. Number two, if you're going to present this as, as if it's for believers today, and this is now how you live, you have some big, big problems with some of the things Jesus says here in this Sermon on the Mount as well as some of the things the Bible says elsewhere, because it's pretty clear you cannot live this way. It's pretty clear you cannot live this way. And some of the things that Jesus says, such as Matthew 5, verse 48, be perfect, such as what we saw last week, verse 12 of chapter 6, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. As we said last week, I don't think anybody wants that to be the standard. I don't think anybody wants that to be true. Thank God it's not true anymore. Under the law, that was true. Under the law, if you did not forgive perfectly, you were not forgiven. The law talked about that. In fact, under the law, if you did not do everything perfectly, you were not forgiven. It's pretty clear as you study this sermon that Jesus is presenting the law. And we saw this even last week, again, in what we now know as the Lord's Prayer, verses 9 through 15 of chapter 6. Yes, there are some good reminders in there, for sure. But I think the main thrust of that prayer, the main point in that prayer is verse 12. And so Jesus taught them a prayer to pray, another reminder, every time they said this prayer, that they were not forgiven that they were not good enough to be forgiven. Forgive us our sins as we forgive our, our, our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So if you don't perfectly forgive and perfectly love and never ever remember it and never ever bring it up ever again and have no bitterness to every single person who's ever wronged you ever, if you don't do that perfectly, then you are not forgiven. That's what Jesus is saying. And that's why I said, I don't think anybody wants that Today, now the good news is, under the new covenant, that is not the case. 
right? We looked at this last week. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. Here's new covenant forgiveness. Different than old covenant as, as far as us forgiving others. It says this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. The same thing is repeated there in Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13. I won't read it now, but we read it last week. That's very different from Matthew 6, verse 12. You see, under the law, if you did not forgive, you were not forgiven. Under the new covenant... Because we are forgiven, we now desire to forgive. And if we don't forgive perfectly, it does not change the forgiveness that we already possess, praise God. And just to illustrate this further, Jesus ended last week, we saw this, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Again, under the law, that is absolutely true. Today, it is not. By the grace of God, we desire to forgive because we know we have been forgiven. But it does not affect the forgiveness we possess if we do not forgive perfectly. And don't get me wrong, I am not saying at all to not forgive. Absolutely not. That is sin. Sin is never good for us. It never works out, right? It's always, always bad, always has consequences. What I am saying is that when you inevitably do not forgive perfectly, and when I inevitably do not forgive perfectly because we are not perfect, and so we will fall short, that even though we do not forgive perfectly sometimes, we are still forgiven perfectly by Jesus because of what he did on the cross. And so we need to rest in that grace, rest in that forgiveness. And that, I think, is the main point of this sermon for us today. We read these things and we just thank God for his grace and for his mercy. And that is always a good thing. Anything that makes us think, about the grace of God and our need for the grace of God is always a very good thing. Well, this morning, we're going to see that again. This morning, we're going to really see more of the same. Once again, Jesus will show them and all men who are willing to listen to what he actually says that they fall short, that they do not measure up, that they cannot do these things. And therefore, we once again thank God for his grace. Though there are certainly in this passage some great truths that apply to all men at all times, the main thrust of it continues to be, be perfect. Because if you're not perfect, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so this morning, the first three verses deals with fasting. And we know fasting is really still a great spiritual and physical discipline. It's very good for you. It's good for us physically to fast. It's good for us spiritually to fast. Absolutely. Wonderful thing. But let's see what Jesus says about this, especially to them within the context of this sermon. So verse 16, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites, of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now Jesus probably has their leaders in mind more than anything when he says this. And remember, a couple weeks ago, we saw this. Back in chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I won't read the whole thing, but remember Jesus said that you're hypocrites. You're hypocrites when you do good things to be seen of men. You're hypocrites when you pray to be seen of men. And remember, their leaders did that. They were always out there making a big show of their religion, a big show of their prayers, a big show of all that they did, all that they said, the money they gave, all of it. They were always making a big show of it. And they also made a show of their fasting. They wanted people to know they were fasting. 
So they would play the part, right? Make themselves look sad, make themselves look a little bit disfigured, a little bit weary or tired or whatever it might be. They wanted the applause of men. They wanted the show. They lived for that, really, in, in many ways. Remember, Jesus talks about these men as hypocrites later on, really he hammers them very hard in Matthew chapter 23, just to read a few verses, Matthew 23, verses 25 through 28, he says this, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity." And so Jesus always had a problem with these men, as we know. He always attacked these men. He always attacked this false religion of Judaism at that time, for sure. And here, again, he says, look, these guys are hypocrites. And you're a hypocrite, too, if you do what they do. If you do things to be seen of men, to look good on the outside, then you are a hypocrite. And you have your reward. You have your reward, as he says. They have their reward then. He said that in, in verses 1 through 8 as well. Look, if you do things to be seen of men, yeah, men will applaud you and men will approve of you, but you know who will not? God. God will not approve of you. God will not applaud you. You have your reward. And I would say that any man who gets the approval of his fellow men rather than God, he has gone the wrong end of that deal because the approval of man is fickle and it's fleeting and they like you today, but they will not like you tomorrow and someone else will come along and, and out-religion you and outdo you or out-give you or something and all of a sudden you're yesterday's news. So if that's what you want then go ahead, but you're really getting the wrong end of that deal. And I was thinking about this. Why is it that men do this? Why is it that these men did this? But let's not kid ourselves, right? It wasn't just these men. This was all the people had this within them. This is all people of all time who have this within them to want to be seen of men to want to outwardly look good for men. We all have that in us. Even still, even as believers, we sometimes have this within us, probably a lot more than we wish. Now, we need to rest in God's grace because I think if we do, as we'll, as we'll talk about, that will help a whole lot. But why do men do this, especially unsaved men, religious men? Why do they crave the approval of others. Well, the obvious reason is pride, right? We know that because they are prideful. They want to appear good and appear religious and all of that. But I think there's another reason which is closely related to the first. And that is their own insecurity. You see, I believe, I think the Bible makes this clear, pride and insecurity really go hand in hand because if you're a proud person, then you're relying on yourself. And you'll realize eventually, unless you're delusional, but you'll realize eventually that, gee, I probably won't always be able to do everything the way I wish I could. So as I rely on myself, I begin to falter. And then I begin to grow insecure because I know I'm going to fall short. And so I'm both proud and insecure at the same time. And I think religious people struggle with this. You see, why would they be insecure? Because they cannot rest in the Father's approval. They don't have God's approval. They don't have God's reward. And all their work and all their religion and everything they try to do to convince themselves and to convince others 
that they are approved of God. It all falls short, and they know it falls short. Why do they know it? How do they know it? Because God says he's written his law on their hearts. Romans chapter 2, verse 15. And if he's written his law on their hearts, if the law condemns men, then men know that they are condemned. Deep down, they know that they are falling short. They know there is something missing. Like the rich young ruler, we'll get to that story here eventually, and that's an incredible story, once again, of Jesus using the law to show men their sin. Here's a man who thought he was doing everything right. He said himself, I've kept all those laws, but what am I still missing? He knew he was missing something. You see, religious people, they know they're missing something. These men these leaders of theirs, they knew they were still missing something. And so in their minds, because of their insecurity, they believe that if they can gain the approval of men, then maybe, just maybe, it will show they also have the approval of God. And of course, it will not. And deep down, even they understand it will not. Now, I think, unfortunately, there are even some in the church today, at least in the professing church today, that are like this. There are some who do not understand the gospel, who do not understand the grace of God, and they are hoping desperately to be approved by God, and the only way they know how is to get man's approval, because man's approval must then prove that I have God's approval, and rather than just resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ and resting in the grace of God, there is no rest for them. There is no rest for a religious man. There is no rest for someone outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no assurance of love or forgiveness. All there is is this constant desire to gain the approval of God, knowing deep down that I do not have it yet. And to help, I will try to gain the approval of men also. That's all there really is for a religious person. For us today, there is rest. There is 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Behold, what manner of love. I, I can imagine John, as he was led to write that, so excited. Behold, what manner of love this is. How can I contain my excitement over this love? And how can I remind myself more and more of this love and just rest in this love? That's what it is for believers. We rest in the love that we already have, in the grace we've already been given, in the forgiveness we already possess. We don't then need to go out and do a bunch of religious things to prove to people how good we are, to prove to ourselves how good we are. Because again, it all stems from the inward insecurities that religious men have. They know they do not measure up. And so they want to try to prove it somehow. Do not do that to yourself today. If you're a child of God in here today, you already measure up. You are already forgiven and already perfect in the sight of God. You don't need to try to prove it. You don't need to try to prove it to me, to your neighbor, to your spouse, or to God. You already have it. And now you rest in that grace and allow that grace and God's indwelling spirit to empower whatever work he wants for you to do. Now, fasting is a good thing. Jesus talks about fasting. Fasting is a good thing. We should fast. If God leads us to fast, we absolutely should. And you know what? It's good for us physically as well. Very good for us. The Bible talks a lot about fasting. But when we fast, it's for our good. It's not to earn God's approval. It's something we do personally, not to show men how great we are. We don't need to show men how great we are. God knows. God knows. And so we can rest in the grace of God. We can thank God that we no longer have to be perfect. And it doesn't just go with fasting. It goes with everything that we might do in this Christian life. We don't need to do things to be seen of men. 
We don't need man's approval. And yes, as men, we desire man's approval sometimes. We know that. That's not good. And we need God's grace to help us to be humble. But when it comes to convincing ourselves that we're on the right track, we don't need that. We already know. If we rest in what the Bible actually says and rest in what Jesus has actually done, then we will be in good shape and we will be just fine. And so we want to rest in the grace of God. We thank God we no longer have to be perfect, but we already are perfect in the sight of God. And so as Jesus says, but thou when thou fastest, verse 17, anoint thy head, wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So again, we now have the grace to go about our walk with God without, without letting anyone else know what it is we're doing or what it is we're not doing. Knowing that God sees, knowing that God approves, resting in the grace of God. And of course, if we sin, God does not approve of our sin. Obviously, we know that. But God still approves of us even when we sin. And we praise God for that. And we are already forgiven. And we praise God for that. And he gives us grace to not do it the next time, right? And we continue to seek him for grace to continue to draw closer to him, of course, as we know. But we don't need to prove to ourselves. We don't need to prove to God. We don't need to prove to anyone how great we are. We're not that great, right? But in God's eyes, we are perfect and perfectly forgiven. Jesus says, look, if you're going to fast in secret, if you're going to do anything in secret, whether it's pray, whether it's give money, whatever it is, if you do these things in secret, guess what? Guess who sees and guess who knows and guess who rewards you? It's God. It's God. And notice, he'll even reward you openly. So that's the ironic thing in all this. If you desire man's approval and you do things to be approved of men, that's your reward and nothing from God. But if you desire God's approval, not only... Does God reward and bless those who do things for him? But he often does it in an open sense so that, so that even men will see it. And so that's the ironic thing. The approval you may have wanted, you'll actually get if you do things God's way. Now, the question is, are you doing this? That's the question Jesus would have for them. Are you doing this? Are you fasting and praying and giving and doing good just because you love God? Are you being perfect even as God is perfect? And while we're at it, what about all those other things I already told you? Jesus could say, are you not lusting after anyone? Have you never been angry at anyone? Are you always honest in all of your dealings with people? Do you love your enemies? Do you love anyone the way you should? And if you think you're doing pretty good with these things, the standard is not pretty good. The standard is perfection. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So are you even getting a little thing like fasting down perfectly? Probably not, right? Probably not. Again, that chapter 5, verse 48 really needs to color everything else in this sermon. I believe that is the lens that we see this sermon through. They have to be perfect. If they are not perfect, they cannot be the children of God. Well, of course they're not being perfect. Of course we are not perfect. Of course no one, except for Jesus himself, ever lived perfectly on this earth. Therefore, no one can receive salvation. Once again, Jesus could say, you are failing. You are failing, but knowing that you are failing is actually a very good thing because in knowing that, you can then come to the cross of Jesus Christ, receive grace, and receive forgiveness. So he talks about fasting. Well, beginning in verse 19 and all the way through verse 24 today, he talks about our treasure, that which we hold dear, 
Really, earthly versus heavenly treasure. And I'd say, and I think you'd agree, this is another area of failure for all men. For all men, especially given what Jesus says here today. It's pretty clear this is another area of failure for all men. So let's look at what he says. Now, verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Earthly treasure does not last forever. I think we all know that. I think most unsaved people know that. Earthly treasure, it does not last forever. There is so much that can happen to it. And Jesus just mentions a few things here. The moths could eat it. It could rust. It, it gets old. It gets worn down. It breaks down. Thieves can come and steal it. You might just lose it yourself because you're not the brightest person all the time either. right? So, so many things can happen to earthly treasure. So many things can happen to earthly treasure. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4 says, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Now the Bible says over and over again that we are to labor, but here it says labor not to be rich. Now we're to labor for what we need and to labor for money. And it's okay, and praise God, if you happen to get rich from your labor, that's actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But that should not be the end goal of it all, that we should not be laboring just to get rich. The Bible says, cease from your own wisdom. That's man's wisdom. That is man's earthly wisdom, that if I'm rich, if I have everything I need financially, then I'm going to be just fine. That's man's wisdom, and God says, cease from that wisdom and even at this time and we've talked about this even at this time they believed that earthly wealth was a sign of god's favor and a sign of god's blessing and look let's be clear the bible tells us what to do with our money it tells us to work for money it tells us to be wise with our money to to save our money, to give our money. It tells us these things, and it tells us that if we do these things, we're probably going to be okay, right? Proverbs talks a lot about this. Proverbs are general truths, right? Generally speaking, you will be okay if you do these things, for sure. So we understand that, right? We understand that, that if we do what God's Word says, we're probably going to be okay. But... There are a lot of people that are not doing what God's Word says, and they're filthy rich, right? They have all sorts of money. There are false teachers out there preaching false gospels, leading people to hell, and they have more money than we'll ever see in our lives, right? They have so much, and their churches are gigantic, and this and that. And again, you might have a big church and be preaching the gospel, but you might have a big church and not be preaching the gospel. So we cannot look and say, well, they have money and they have a lot, so they must be doing what's right. We just can't do that. But that's what they did, and unfortunately, many do that today as well. We often mistake outward blessing for God's favor. It's just not the case sometimes. But at that time, they certainly believed that. And remember, again, to mention the rich young ruler, he was rich, right? And he went away, and he was not following Christ when he went away. And remember, Jesus said to his disciples, it is so hard for a rich man to get saved. He talked about this in Matthew 19, verses 23 through 26. And his disciples said to him, well, who then can be saved? Because in their minds, the rich were the best people. They had God's blessing and God's favor. So if they can't be saved, then who can be saved? And remember what Jesus said to them? He said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's pretty much the theme of this Sermon on the Mount. You're absolutely right. With men, this is impossible. With men, salvation is impossible. Because you will never be perfect as God is perfect. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. And through the grace of God, men can recognize their sin and repent of their sin and be saved from their sin. So Jesus, again, says here in verse 19, it's not about earthly wealth. 
And don't make it about earthly wealth. Now, that's still true today for us as well, right? We know that. And again, still today, there are many who, who think, as I said, that earthly wealth is a sign of, of divine favor. In fact, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 5, Paul writes about those who suppose that gain is godliness. And he says, from such withdraw yourself. And then he goes on to say the love of money is the root of all evil in that passage. Not money, not money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Not money itself, the love of money. And so again, there are those who think that the more I have, the more godly I am. And there are those, and unfortunately, this is most, if not all people, at least at some point, who want to have more, who think they need more, who are too consumed with earthly treasure. Jesus says, don't do this. He says in verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Yes, absolutely, right? That is all very true. Absolutely. Nothing can get to what's laid up in heaven. The thieves can't steal. The moths won't eat it. won't break down or wear down. This is very, very true. And of course, we today should be seeking heavenly riches and things above. But here's the question. Are you doing it perfectly? Are we doing it perfectly? And the answer is no, we're not. They weren't. And that's what Jesus' whole point is. You are not doing this perfectly. And let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you, he says. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And really, the next four verses prove it, as we'll discuss. But let's just look at this one first. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, that's very true, first of all, right? We understand that when you look at a man... You know what he cares about based on what he does, right? And where his money is and how he spends his money and how he spends his time and how he spends his energy. You know what's important to someone based on those things. And that's what Jesus is saying, of course. But remember this. God demands your entire heart, Right? God demands your entire heart. So Jesus says, look, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where's your heart? Well, God demands the entire heart. This is what he said in the law. Remember, Jesus is teaching the law. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. That's what the law says. The law says you need to love God with every fiber of your being. All the time. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. Jesus came to teach the law, right? He taught the law so that men would see their need to be saved from their sin. Go to Matthew chapter 22, if you will, for a moment. Because Jesus reiterates this. Why? Because he always taught the law to get them to see their need to be forgiven. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So I suppose Jesus could have made it easy on himself and just said that and not preached the Sermon on the Mount, right? Because he was preaching the law. And here he says, that is the law, right? If you love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, that is the whole law. And he's absolutely right. Now he preached the Sermon on the Mount to show them how they were not doing those things. They were not loving God with their whole heart. They were not loving their neighbor as themselves. Guess what? No man can. No man will. And even to this day, 
We often say and hear people say, and maybe we think to ourselves, I need to love God with all my heart. Yes, you can try to love God with all your heart. I guarantee you, you will never love God with all your heart. I guarantee you never will. I guarantee I never will. I hope you don't think that Pastor Mike loves God with all his heart. That could not be further from the truth. Look, I want to love God more. I want my heart to be more consumed with God. I absolutely do. But could I stand up here and tell you I love God with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my mind? No, I never could do that. And you could not either. But here's the good news. You don't have to do that to be saved. Again, what is Jesus doing in Matthew 22 as well as here in Matthew 5 through 7? He's showing them this is impossible. If this is what the law is, and the Sermon on the Mount teaches the law, once again, it is impossible. You do not love God with all your heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But God demands, the law demands the entire heart. Who can say they are giving God their entire heart? No one can say that. But then what we can say is that because of that, I've come to the cross of Jesus Christ. And I am forgiven for my sin. And I am forgiven for the fact that I do not give God my entire heart. I would not even know how to begin to do that. I don't think anyone does. It is impossible for us to truly be giving God our entire heart. But I thank God that we do not have to. I thank God that when we fall miserably short... We are still mercifully forgiven. And God's grace is still sufficient each and every day. So realizing this, going back to this Sermon on the Mount, realizing that where your treasure is, there where your heart be also, realizing that our heart is not perfect in the sight of God, it either drives us to the cross for the first time or it keeps us at the cross Never, ever getting too full of ourselves, never thinking that now somehow I can take over for God because now I have learned to love God with all my heart and with all my mind. I am doing all the right things on my own. No, we as believers know that we never will get to that point on this earth. And yet, by the grace of God, in his sight, we are at that point already. We are perfect in his sight. So where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then he illustrates this point. And really, again, all these verses here, the next three verses, really do illustrate this point, make it very, very clear that this is not something that we can do and this is not something that is possible for men. He says, the light of the body is the eye if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. That's a somewhat archaic even uh, verse and expression these days. Basically what Jesus is saying is you, you take the world in through your eyes. If your eye is healthy, then you're going to be okay. If your eye is single, with that, that singular focus, single-minded on God, right? That he is your total and complete focus. If that's you, then you will have light. If God is your singular focus, then you will have light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. So if your eye is not singularly focused on Jesus, on God, on his word and his truth at all times, then you have darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And isn't that the point of this Sermon on the Mount? How great is the darkness within you, is what Jesus says. How great is the darkness within you, the state of evil in your heart, the evil within you, within your heart, it shows where you are before God, and it shows that you are in darkness. And again, there might be some who would argue with this and who would say, but I do put God first, and I am focused on God, and I do try to do all the right things. But again, the question is, are you perfect in that? Because if you're not perfect in it, then you're still falling short. So either you're full of light or you're full of darkness. To be full of light, though, you need to be perfect. And then he says, verse 24, no man can serve two masters. 
And yet how many then and now are trying to do that? But you can't, right? Because God demands the entire heart. And so you can't. You can't be right in God's sight and do that. God wants your entire heart. You can't give it to him, but he wants it. He needs it. You can't give it to him. I thank God now, though, right, as children of God, he has our heart, though we don't seek him perfectly even now, as we just said, but we're saved. He's changing our hearts, and he's working in us. Praise God. He says here, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon, or God and money. And that's often the choice, isn't it? It's God or money for people, because the love of money is the root of all evil. Right? That's what people want, is money and power and fame and all those things that money brings. And that's really the choice that people face, and that's really the choice that people have to make. Do I want God, or do I want money? But again, you have to do it perfectly. You have to want God perfectly. You cannot serve two masters. So if whenever you're choosing money, you're not choosing God. And whenever you're choosing earthly treasure, you're not choosing heavenly treasure. And when you're doing that, you're not being perfect. And so then how could you claim to to be a child of God. How could you claim to be following God? You're not perfect. That's the point of the sermon. Now Jesus said something, which I think is worth saying here to help us understand this a little better. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And yet God actually tells us that we're to love everybody, right? If we hate people, we're breaking the law. So obviously, Jesus is not telling us to hate people, right? Well, that was a, a common idiom, really, in, in Judaism and at that time. Not saying that this is you actually hate, but compared, comparatively speaking, it's like hate. So what Jesus was saying is not that you're to hate your family, but compared to your love for me. It should be like hate. Not that you should hate your own life. The Bible tells us no one has ever yet hated their own lives. Not that you should hate your own life, but that your love for me should make your love for yourself look like hatred. So that's what Jesus was saying. Well, that's the same thing right here. I think there are probably Christians who, who walk around trying to figure out, how can I hate money? You're not called to hate money. You don't have to hate money. The point is you have to love God. You have to love God. Now, you can't serve God and money, Jesus says. You have to choose one. You have to love God. You have to choose God. So he says to them here, look, you cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. So not only are they not serving God, but he tells them they cannot serve God. They cannot serve God because they are not doing this perfectly because God's kingdom demands exclusive loyalty which no man can give. God's kingdom demands exclusive loyalty which no man can give. God demands the entire heart. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. God demands the entire heart. And if you have some treasure here on earth, then that's where your heart is. And if that's where your heart is, then it's not with God, and you are not perfect, and you are destined to an eternity apart from Jesus Christ to suffer for your sins forever and ever. That is the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. As we've been saying week after week here, this is the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. Once again, to show men their sin, to teach men, to teach religious men. That's who his audience was. It was religious men, not, this, not just the religious leaders, but the people who wanted to be like the religious leaders, who wanted to be more religious. The audience of this sermon was those people, and the purpose of this sermon was to teach them and all religious men who have come after them that their religion is failing them that they are not perfect, that they cannot be children of God because they will never be perfect. 
as their Father which is in heaven is perfect. And in that failure, reminding them of that, showing them that they can, for the first time, come to Jesus Christ, who in a few short years, probably about a year and a half from now, as he preached this sermon, would be dying on a cross for the sins of the world. But only those who first come to grips with their own sinfulness, who first recognize, I am not perfect. God does not have my whole heart. I am not following this law the way I was told to follow this law. Only those who recognize that will be ready to come and to receive this great gift that Jesus Christ will offer. And so the purpose of this sermon, blessed are the sinners who know they are sinners. Yes, we see some great truths, some great reminders today, some things about fasting, some things about doing things for God's glory, not to be seen of men, some things about money. All of these things are great reminders for sure, great truths that apply to all men at all times. But the greatest truth for us today is to thank God that we no longer have to be perfect. We are no longer demanded by God to give our entire heart to God in order to merit his kingdom, because that is impossible. Now that we have been forgiven, that we have received his grace, we want to give him our heart, and we want to give him our life. And when we fall short in doing that the way we want to, it's okay, we're still forgiven, we're still his children. So we rest in that forgiveness, we rest in that grace, we rest in that mercy, and we praise God for it, hopefully, each and every day as much as we can. And so let's pray now, and once again, just thank God for these great, great truths. And so, Lord Jesus, we do thank you today for this truth. We thank you every day, God, that we are forgiven. We are forgiven. You demand perfection. You demand the entire heart. That was something we could not give. And yet you did not demand it because you wanted to keep us dead in our sin. You actually demanded it so that we could then be free from sin to realize that it's impossible to then come and receive your mercy and receive your grace. And so we thank you for the high demands of the law. We thank you, Lord God, for revealing to us our sinfulness, so that we can then receive your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord God. We pray you would reveal this to many. Reveal this to many. God, if there are those who sit in churches week after week, and we know there are, who are not saved, who are just in another religion, who are trying to somehow earn your approval through their works, not really understanding what the gospel is, we pray, Father God, that you will reveal these things to them that you will cause them to see their sinfulness and to receive your mercy and your forgiveness. God, we pray for those that have never even set foot in a church, that they, by your grace, by your work, Holy Spirit, will begin to have their hearts changed as well, begin to realize their need for you, that you would give us grace as we go out and minister to them. Help us to be bolder and wiser in our witness to declare your truth, O oh God, and also in our own lives to rest in your truth, to rest in the fact that we are forgiven, we have received your grace and your mercy, and now we are free to follow you. Now we are free to follow you without condemnation. Now we are free to actually want to give you our lives and want to give you our heart and not being condemned when we don't do it perfectly. So we thank you for that, Father God. We thank you for that. So we ask you, Lord God, to just continue to teach us and to encourage us in these things, to help us, Lord God, and of course to bless us as only you can. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.